that to be educated in the 21st century does not mean you have just a narrow base of specialization only, but rather that you have the soft skills, teamwork, the leadership skills, the critical thinking ability, and the problem-solving capacity to address many different interconnected problems that have many different angles and dimensions to them. So what we train is the ability to think both deeply within a specialization to understand multi-dimensional problems. That is exactly what the market wants. Hello and welcome to uh, the Quốc Khánh Show podcast. I'm Quốc Khánh, your host. Uh, thank you for tuning in, uh, and please sub subscribe to our YouTube channel, v Success, or follow us on uh, podcast platforms such as uh, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to uh, subscribe our newsletter that's coming out every Thursday morning. And you can click on the link below and uh, put in your email. My guest today uh, is a professor. Uh, he graduated with a bachelor degree in social cultural anthropology from Michigan State University. At Princeton University, he completed a master's degree in public administration, regional planning and urban affairs, followed by a doctoral degree in public administration and international relations. He was a member of the Leadership Board of Educational Innovation Initiative at the New York University Shanghai and at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore, where he was a founding faculty and member of leadership team. He is an experienced university administrator with many outstanding achievements from building and laying the foundations for new universities. He also innovated and developed long-standing educational institution through strategic vision and shop development orientation. So it's my honor to welcome Professor Scott Fritzen, the new president of Fulbright University, Vietnam. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wonderful Hello. to be here. Thank you. It's uh, a pleasure. I saw your video speaking Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> you are excellent. So I, I just thought, why don't we just get you know, get started, do a little bit warm up in Vietnamese to see how you're doing and put a little bit challenge for you. Are you ready for that? We can try. <laughs> oh, we, oh, we can do the whole interview. I better drink some more coffee. Let's get some yeah, coffee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or we can do the whole conversation mm. in Vietnamese. But let's pass okay. my test first. Test okay. my test. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. ready. Yeah. I'm ready. And yeah. Scott, how about you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cố gắng thôi. <laughs> uh, không biết là anh Scott đã đến Việt Nam uh, quay trở lại lần này là được uh, Then, bao lâu rồi? Đã, đã rất lâu rồi. Uh, lần đầu tiên sang Việt Nam là năm 94. Yeah, năm 94. Uh, rất lâu năm, rồi. Yeah. Thôi ra lắm rồi. Yeah. <cười> <cười> rồi. Bây giờ thì rồi. <cười> quay lại đây gần đây là quay trở lại. Gần đây quay trở lại uh, cách đây 4 tháng. 4 tháng. 4 không tháng. biết là anh đã từng có dịp đi du lịch ở Việt Nam chưa và chưa, có chỗ chưa nào thích có không? cơ hội nào trong 4 tháng vừa rồi <cười> nhưng mà trước đây uh, đi khá nhiều uh, nhất là đi thực tế uh, khi đang uh, thực hiện uh, loạt án thiền sĩ uh, đi đi khắp nơi ở Việt Nam rất là may mắn uh, đi cả 53 uh, 53 tỉnh uh, lúc ấy thì 53 bây giờ là 60 61 61 yeah. 61 đúng không yeah. uh, 64 64 64 yeah. ah, yeah. ok À, đã thăng thêm con số đó yeah. <cười> đã đi được rất nhiều mà đi du lịch một chút nữa nếu mà chọn à. ra ba địa điểm mà anh ba thích địa nhất điểm. ba địa điểm thôi à <cười> cả nước được. lớn và đẹp yeah. như thế mà chỉ chọn ba điểm vậy, thôi à về nhiều hơn cũng được Ôi anh thích chỗ nào anh thích chỗ nào nhất khó lắm à, thích thích nhất là là Hà Long Bay oh, wow. mà có thể giải thích được tại sao tại sao một lý do rất đặc biệt là cái hobby của của tôi là rock climbing oh. là leo núi Thật à. À, oh. yeah. và ở đó thì uh, rất tốt làm được uh, rất thú vị uh, và kích thích lắm uh, có thể leo thẳng uh, lên trên uh, cái núi đó yeah. 
rất thích Hạ Long Bay uh, nổi tiếng trên thế giới ngoài Hạ Long Bay cho, có chỗ nào khác nữa ừ. gọi là nói là leo núi không phải là leo núi như uh, chẳng hạn ở biên giới uh, ở, ở Sapa vân vân và leo núi uh, cliff climbing đó uh, đi thẳng uh, wow. trực tiếp và lên Còn... đương nhiên dùng dây rồi, okay. <cười> không phải điên điên khủng khủng yeah. wow tiếng việt của anh là thì, xuất sắc thì, luôn vẫn vẫn còn thích sống yeah. nói tiếng việt kia là mình là nói nguyên một cuộc trò chuyện là cũng đủ luôn á anh học tiếng việt như thế nào mà nói giỏi vậy chưa nói giỏi đâu nhiều sai lầm lắm à, nhưng mà chủ yếu học bằng cách đi thực tế yeah. à, đi thực tiễn à, và tiếp tiếp cận được với nhiều bạn à, nhiều bạn bè À, nhưng mà đã có một mùa hè à, đã được một cái học bổng từ cái thời khi à, đang học ở Princeton oh. như cô Khai nói đấy yeah. à, thì đã được một cái học bổng để học một cách tập trung ở Việt Nam cho 3 tháng nhưng mà quan trọng là cứ tự cười về mình đừng có take yourself too seriously yeah. đúng không anh nói vậy à, là em thấy rồi. anh thấy quá 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 dữ rồi đó <cười> giờ tiếp tục học à, mấy bạn có chuẩn bị một cái trò chơi nhỏ nhỏ để thử thách anh oh, một giờ, cái game bây giờ sợ lắm rồi yeah. <cười> nhanh thôi à mấy bạn uh, team okay, okay. Thử team thử gọi thử là thử. tongue twisters <cười> sẵn mà, lưỡi mà các người nghe uh, nên nó, nên biết là trước khi bắt đầu cuộc đối thoại này tôi cố gắng uh, thuyết phục quốc khanh nói trước À, về không, cái game này không nói chuyện à, thử chối luôn <cười> không nói chuyện hay thử thách mà không để cho Scott cheat luôn <cười> ok bây giờ thử thách khả năng okay, bây giờ thì yeah. xem lần đầu tiên đọc và phát âm tiếng việt của của okay. anh Scott như thế nào thử ha thôi. ba câu thôi okay. ba câu này thực ra là đó đôi khi là người việt nói nhanh là cũng gặp sai chứ thử nha wow quá nguy hiểm buổi trưa ăn buổi trưa <cười> buổi trưa ăn bữa trưa yeah you got it ok is that right yeah you okay. got it ok I better read this carefully first. Yeah. Nồi đồng nấu ốc, nồi tất nấu ếch. Wow, you got it perfectly. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay, number three. Um, your finger is covered. Okay, <laughs> okay let's see. Ông bụt ở chùa cầm bùa tuổi chuột. Tuổi, tuổi, tuổi. Okay, tuổi try that again. Ông bụt, ông bụt ở chùa cầm bùa tuổi chuột. You got it. Okay. <cười> yeah, là nghĩ là quá đủ đủ rồi đó đủ 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 hay rồi đó đủ đủ xuất sắc rồi. We are not off to a good start. <cười> let's, let's off to a good start. I'm not gonna challenge you anymore. I okay. hope the uh, right. the Vietnamese audience can really understand oh, okay. you and uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah. Well, thank you so but, much. But remember, if you're ever learning a foreign language, no mm. matter what it is, just be willing to laugh at yourself. Don't uh, be yep. afraid to make mistakes. That's that's, good that's my. That's a good I've lesson. learned five languages in my life. Yeah. Uh, besides English, and that's the key that I discovered. Just be willing to have fun with it. That's a good lesson for yeah. uh, for yeah. student here to learn English. Yeah, same thing, right? It is actually. <laughs> it's the same thing, absolutely. And I think Vietnamese are amazing mm. at learning English. I am continuously amazed how well Vietnamese have learned English most of the time without going overseas. Mm -hmm. So many young people in Vietnam have studied just by watching TV. Sure. Uh, I've met more people who told me mm. that they learned Vietnamese, uh, learned English yep. by watching Friends. Oh yeah, yeah, I heard uh, that before than too. Anywhere, you know. <laughs> And uh, one one Fulbright student actually told me she watched multiples all the seasons of Friends uh -huh. multiple yeah. times. And by the end, she was covering the the uh, subtitles so that she could test herself and her understanding. That's a good movie. To had study. never been had never been overseas, but spoke f really fluently. Yeah. That's a good one to, uh, to study English. I wish Americans <laughs> would study foreign languages with the same enthusiasm. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, Most yeah. of us Americans do not. <laughs> Find a Vietnamese series, something like that. Yeah. Vietnamese drama. <laughs> exactly. to, to learn well, it. if we did, Quoc Khanh, which series would you recommend? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. For Americans to learn yeah, Vietnamese. I don't have anything on top of my mind right now. Okay, tell me later. Send me Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Vietnamese drama has been a long time. Yeah, that would be fun. All right, so thank All you right. for coming. Sure. And thank you for coming to Vietnam. Uh, oh, you returned to Vietnam and you've been here. You actually came here before 1994, 30 years ago, as a Fulbright scholar. Uh, scholar. You got a scholarship, Fulbright scholarship. The first one 
after the war. That the first American to be awarded a Fulbright wow. Scholar uh, position uh, to come back to Vietnam since the war. Yeah, and then so now, just a historical curiosity. Wow. And then after the, almost thirty yeah, years, thirty years you later, came back again as the president, as the new president of Fulbright University of Vietnam. What a coincidence! What a Coincidence, and really, I would say it's a dream. It's a、yeah. wonderful job. It's a chance to reconnect with Vietnam and to contribute、mm-hmm. to the education sector in Vietnam, which、mm-hmm. is so important for our world and for young people, because we have the chance to change lives.、Right. Education is about changing the trajectory of a young person's life,、mm-hmm. and that's what we're trying to do every day at Fulbright University.、Right. What is your expectation for this role when you come back here? Well, it's a young university. We are about five years old. We just graduated our first class of undergraduates. First batch, first batch of、ago. undergraduates.、Yeah. Of course, I must also say we have had the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program (FETP),、yep. which goes back over twenty-five years, twenty-eight、right. years to be precise.、Mm. That was the founding graduate school, and we have more than two thousand graduates of the. Public policy、uh, training program since that time, so Fulbright University is starting from a strong foundation in this、mm-hmm. graduate program, adding the undergraduates five years ago.、Mm-hmm. Just graduated the first class. So to go to your question, what is my expectation? My expectation is hard work and sleepless nights <laughs> as we build up the university,、uh, because it's a hard work, right? It's like any startup in a new environment. No matter how good the positioning, no matter how good the design, no matter how good your colleagues,、hmm. it, you still have so much to build and so much potential to realize. And that's what we're doing every day at Fulbright is trying to build up. And you know, we're like a seed that has grown into a small tree that will go, grow into a great large tree. Right.、Uh, the tamarind tree of our logo,、uh, but we have a long way to go. And so every day we're working hard. I can imagine、it. so、yeah. many challenges waiting for you ahead. I'm just gonna go right into it. Please.、Um, talking about Fulbright University of Vietnam, it's been in the discussion for many years on the news, at conference, as many workshops, and it's been around parents and students about the topic of liberal art education or yeah, you can't form. You understand Vietnamese. Everybody talk <laughs> about it, and sometimes school even got you know got advertised or branded themselves as. Liberal arts school, in order to try to attract students. Sure. And I, Bởi vì nói thì dễ. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe、um, there's some general misunderstanding, or something need to be need to demystify the concept. And、um, there also skepticism from parents. There is because、yeah. they talk about liberal arts education, and they heard about students just studying general topics. Uh, not specific industry, not specific major. Are they going to be ready for the real world out there when they graduate?、Um, are they going to have specific skill in different in specific fields when they、uh, finish school? So that's all the concern and the kind of confusing about the concepts. So from a president of、yes. a liberal. Art school here in Vietnam, Fulbright University of Vietnam.、Uh, could you demystify this? Could you explain the concept?、Uh, what really happened at Fulbright University? What do you teach the students? And do we should we have the concern over you know what I just mentioned about about the you know the the readiness for the student when they finish school? Quốc Khánh, that's a great question, and I would love to take it on. There's a famous expression. It goes like this: Nothing is as practical as a good theory.、Mm-hmm. Wow. Most of the time, people think something theoretical in general、uh, must not must be very far from the everyday practicality. But it's just the opposite. If the theory is good, not any theory, but if the framework is solid, it serves so many different applications. The framework we're talking about today、uh, in your question is liberal arts education, and I would go one step further and say the way we talk about it at Fulbright is liberal arts and sciences education, because the basic ideas that I will talk about apply equally whether you're 
tackling the humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences, computer science, any STEM field. It's the same principles. So what are those principles? What is the good theory that we're building on here? It is this, that to be educated in the 21st century does not mean you have just a narrow base of specialization only, but rather that you have the soft skills, the teamwork, the leadership skills, the critical thinking ability, and the problem-solving capacity to address many different interconnected problems that have many different angles and dimensions to them. Okay, so think about any problem that you're likely to experience out in the real world. How do you address it? Most of those problems have many more sides faces of the problem than just a narrow specialization. For most problems, you have to work in inter uh, cross-functional teams uh, in order to understand the problem first, to diagnose it. What is it in its essence? What drives that problem? Before you can drill down and say, what are some potential solutions? Before you can then say, how do you actually implement those from a technical perspective? So what we train is the ability to think both deeply within a specialization, and I'll get to this in a moment, but to root, to ground that disciplinary specialization in a broader capacity to work with others to understand multidimensional problems. And then to have the soft skills to actually successfully implement that kind of teamwork and problem solving ability. And I'm telling you, that is exactly what the market wants. We've been talking to employers, uh, including those employers from our first undergraduate batch, but definitely true for the businesses and corporations and the government agencies that have hired our public policy school graduates for 28 years now. This is exactly what they want. They want deep functional specialization in a context of somebody who knows how to work across problems. That's the basic idea. So I'm going to ask the next question to myself. Okay. <laughs> yep. what is your your follow-up question is probably, well, how do you do that then? Yes. How do you train these people, yes. right? Yes. Would you like to ask that question? Of course, because, <laughs> because you mentioned um, soft skill yes. and uh, critical thinking, critical thinking skill. And I believe that skill we often never have in Vietnamese school before. We, you know, we kind of follow what the teacher said. Uh, critical thinking is something new to us, to the Vietnamese students. So I'm just curious, how do you train your student with that yes. new concept? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for asking again. So the first key is to recognize that we admit students who want this challenge. We go out and we find the students who are driven by intellectual curiosity as well as practical problem solving and who want to serve society. You can serve society in many different ways, but it's not just about getting a single job after graduation and proving to mom and dad that you're successful. It's about people who want to find their contribution and their connection to the society around them and develop their unique potential in order to fulfill uh, that promise. So that's the first secret of success is finding the right students who want this and recognizing that it's not for everybody. Uh, if you try to fit any the average student into this mold, they will not necessarily succeed. We're looking for the brightest and most motivated students, the students who truly care about their own potential as a human being and as a, as a worker in the future, uh, and who are willing to envision careers as not being one job after graduation, but as a dynamic path of contribution to society and as the unfolding of their own human potential. So that's the first step, is getting the right students. The second step is the core curriculum. What we call the core curriculum is a roughly one to two year sequence that has different steps in which students first are exposed to a range of courses that teach them not in-depth specialization, but how to think about problem solving. 
So for example, you take a, a core course in quantitative reasoning and you go into the logic of using numbers to, to understand and solve problems. You expose them to the techniques, yes, of course, it's all about techniques, but it's about matching the techniques to specific applications and problems in a multi-dimensional way of thinking. That brings out the creativity. These courses are team taught. That means it's not one professor's design where they teach anything that they would like, but rather they come together to, in teams to design this sequence of core courses, which exposes you to different sides of problem solving. Uh, so what you're trying to do is to get people to understand the logic of critical thinking and problem solving through multiple applications and tools that they will be exposed to in the first year to two, one to two years of the curriculum. This has another effect. As you can imagine, if you expose 200, 300, 400 incoming students to this kind of challenging curriculum, to this kind of creative curriculum, and if you uh, have this be taught by a team of faculty that learn from each other mm -hmm. and that are constantly bringing new elements from society, new social challenges, mm -hmm. new examples from the day into the curriculum, well, what do you have? You have tremendous community building happening, where students work together in teams and begin to learn from each other. They support each other. We have a wonderful student culture that is cultivated from the very beginning of a student's uh, experience at Fulbright, where they're working together on problems, uh, helping each other, supporting each other through a very challenging material. And that's not just something nice to have. That's teaching the teamwork skills that will be essential to their future. So that's the second key element, is uh, developing a student culture. The third key element is specialization. So from the end of our students' second year, and already in some cases before that, mm -hmm. students are declaring their major. Okay. Yes, Kwakain, you heard me correct. Yeah. Our students specialize. Okay, so it's the uh, same at a university here. You have two years That part general. is the same, yeah. yeah. general two years, and then the last two years you can select your major, it's right? It's similar in that regard, similar. but the, the question is what we do with those first two years, right? Okay, so that's the a The foundation difference. is very systematic, very integrated and okay. well thought out, and very innovative, right? Okay. It's not just learn a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. It's learn through the method that teaches you practical problem solving in a disciplined, integrated, systematic way. So then they specialize. Um, then the specialized courses, we have 11 different majors at the undergraduate level. Everything from economics to psychology to mathematics to integrated sciences to engineering to computer science to integrated art and media studies. Uh, so we have 11 different fields that you can specialize in, and more are coming, by the way. Okay. Next year, we should have two new additions, uh, one of them artificial intelligence, nice, which is going to be very interesting. <laughs> Alongside traditional <Yep. clears throat> computer science, you will be able to major in artificial intelligence, yep. which is changing the way society works yep. as we speak in ways that will be even more evident in the coming years than they are now. Right. Secondly, we will introduce business education. Okay. Business education, according to the liberal arts and sciences model, will mean solving business problems in a broader context of society. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very excited about those two, initi uh, two initiatives and uh, specializations that students will have to choose from. So uh, the specialization builds on those core skills and teamwork abilities that the students uh, gained in the first two years. Uh, so that's quite similar. Um, and it produces graduates who can think deeply about particular problems, uh, not unlike uh, the way people expect graduates to be experts in a given area. They, they have deep disciplinary knowledge by the time they graduate. This, this is not a choice between general education versus specialization. This is general education plus specialization that leads to a more versatile, dynamic, mm -hmm. problem-solving professional. So I guess it's um, this demystify a little bit about, yeah, it's liberal very important education. Because many people, they stop at those first two years. <laughs> 
and they misunderstand yes. the, the intention of the first two years. Thus, it's going to be all general. All general, and choose whatever you want. A little bit of this, a little bit of okay. that. It's far from it. We have a very structured, systematic, and disciplined approach to Thank education. Thank you for the uh, clarification. There, there is one more element, if you don't mind, mm. uh, for me to Go ahead. share. And it's really critical. Not. It's essential in our model. And that is once you specialize and moving into the third and fourth year of your study, we highly stress the importance of pre-professional and applied experiences out there in society. Mm, how? Not just the classroom. Get out of the classroom. Do multiple internships, not just one. Uh, do in-depth training in particular areas uh, outside of the classroom. We do innovation labs, for example, through our Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, where students take on a project and they work in small groups to see it to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, we do a range of problem-solving capstone exercises, meaning that for your particular field, you have to work with others to develop an applied project and then see it realized in the real world mm -hmm. out there. You work with different partners in the nonprofit sector or in the corporate sector or even with government. You partner with them and see a project fulfilled and the application tested uh, by the time you graduate in your field. And imagine how powerful that is. You graduate not just with theoretical knowledge, right, but with the ability to see a project through to completion and to be able to talk about the different steps from design all the way through to execution and evaluation right. of those different projects. So those are the key elements of our liberal arts education. Strong foundation of problem-solving skills, specialization, teamwork, and other leadership uh, developing uh, exercises, and applied experiences in the field. Together, they form the liberal arts and sciences model that is at the heart of the Fulbright model. Now, there are other colleges that are talking about the liberal arts, but I encourage your listeners to kick the tires, we say in English, meaning test it. What does it mean to them? Liberal arts is easy to say, what is the content? What is the structured approach underlying it? And if you don't understand it, it probably means it's too general. Okay. Yeah. Not all innovations succeed. Most innovations don't succeed. And so, you know, innovation is a wonderful thing, but fasten your seatbelts because the ride is going to be turbulent and bumpy. Uh, because you set up in Vietnam and I understand that you still have to follow the Ministry of Education guidelines here, would that make it difficult for you to apply the, the model here, the, the liberal arts model here, uh, together with the guideline from the local Ministry of Education? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I would point to is that uh, this is an innovative model. And like any innovation, it will experience its challenges in its environment uh, and even its threat of failure, right? Not all innovations succeed. Most innovations don't succeed. And so, you know, innovation is a wonderful thing, but fasten your seatbelts because the ride is going to be turbulent and bumpy. Uh, so we expect that from the beginning, and we attract students, faculty, and leaders who are open to that kind of uh, risk management. We manage the risks, but we have to be open to them and even thrive within them. So that's the first thing. Uh, so don't be, ex don't be disappointed or uh, dejected, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly don't give up when you yeah. encounter some difficulties in the regulatory environment. Diagnose take a step back, figure out what's going on, communicate, uh, and then find your way in this landscape. That's always been our philosophy. Secondly, um, I would like to point out that Fulbright University of Vietnam was established with very high level and deep support from the leadership of both countries' political systems. I see. Um, and that's what you'll see in our literature. When you go on our website, yeah. you'll see pictures of the General Secretary of the Communist Party, yeah, the President I saw that. of the United States. Yeah, I saw that. In multiple iterations over 20 years, meeting with each other and discussing this project, we're very fortunate. There's very high-level support for this experiment in higher education. I'm very happy to say, because that gives us the room to maneuver. You know, If we didn't have that kind of high-level uh, bilateral support, 
it would be a very uncomfortable place to be. The third uh, answer to the question about have you hit any difficulties is that we develop partnerships. And the Ministry of Education and Training has been a good partner to us. You know, most of what we have wanted to do, we've been able to find a way to do it within the existing system. We embrace the accountability as a Vietnamese institution to the regulatory framework. We try to be creative within it, and we try to partner uh, with uh, government and others to try to find pathways forward to do innovative things. So, so far, so good. I have to say it's been a, it's a constant challenge. <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, it's been productive. Yeah, you got the yeah. first batch of graduate already. We do, we do. That's <laughs> well, right. I'm curious because yeah, um, you mentioned Ministry of Education and Training, and of course, because I I study here in Vietnam. I, I went to school in here for for two years before I go to the U.S. Oh, I see. Um, I went to university here, uh, the college here. Which university? Uh, university was of it? Technology. Oh, okay. Oh, really? And I no, study okay. the first two years, which is general studies and we have to study many, many subjects follow with the Ministry of Education guidelines. And I'm just curious if the student at Fulbright University of Vietnam, in the first two years, you say very important to set our foundation, the general study, um, the critical thinking skill, the, the mindset, uh, the ability to solve problems, but then they have to study they still have to take classes yeah. and curriculum mm -hmm. from the old system, from, from the Vietnamese system, oh, right? Yes, yes. Same? Yeah. Oh, uh, so which, are you talking about political education, Something for example? Like that, yeah. Yes, they do. There okay. are a few required subjects. Oh, okay. So you said uh, so that are, to follow. Yes, and okay. we do teach them. And okay. that's one of the areas of constant dialogue But that's with no the conflict with the curriculum at, at FUV. I, you know, I'll give you a simple example, and I'm just being very honest with you now. Um, we are required, like all Vietnamese institutions are, to teach uh, political thought in a particular way. Yes. Uh, what we try to do is not to say there's a right or wrong answer to issues of politics and ideology, mm -hmm. but to put that content side by side with other comparative systems and with a critical way of thinking so that students themselves develop the capacity mm -hmm. to evaluate for themselves sure. uh, what they believe from among many different influences and information, because that's how learning works. You know, well, We're living in an age of information. You can't hide right. differences of opinion, interpretation, different systems that are out there. Every educated person has to understand how to think critically for themselves, sifting through many kinds of information about any country's institutions and sure. politics. And we're no different. We're, we, so we try to give that rich set of tools mm -hmm. for the students to find their feet in their own, uh, uh, in their own, the growth of their own thinking about politics, if you will. But we do so while fully embracing and following this, the curriculum that is prescribed to us in that specific area. There are only a couple of courses like that over the four years, but I'm just being honest to say, yes, there's a little bit of tension, tension because yeah. we don't want to, uh, we don't want to just disconnect that part of the curriculum from the rest. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure it's all joined up and integrated in the student's experience and that it produces well-rounded thinkers who understand their own context sure. and can think critically about it as well. Sure. Thank you for being honest. Sure. I of think course. it's pretty clear now. <laughs> yes. I want to talk more about the, um, the collaboration between school and employers. You yes. mentioned it already. Mm -hmm. And it's been, uh, it's been a topic for many, many years. Yeah. All the school have trying to do that. The join hand between school and university, uh, universities and employers, businesses in order to lower the gap between school and the reality. And uh, it's easier said than done. Um, when students get graduated and then employers you know, hire them and then have to retrain them again, and there's so, so much complaint about, from the employers about the quality of students who graduated from school nowadays. And I know Fulbright University have been tackling this problem, and you mentioned it already, try to catching up with the fast pace of development from, from the business world. But what seemed to be the biggest challenge for you to shake hands with the employers, to give the students a really 
eye-opening practical knowledge and prepare them well for the reality out there yeah. when they finish school? That's a great question. Let me tell you the three factors of success, I think, underlie this challenge. And then I'll tell you which one is the hardest. Okay. The first one is intentionality, again. Mm. So you have to want to build this uh, connection to the corporate and, and the applied world as a university. I have to emphasize to you, universities in their DNA are like islands. If you're not careful, they just become a silo. They just become an island that is in isolated. disconnected, isolated. Yeah. Because the main constituencies of a traditional university, like the faculty, are not typically very connected to the working world around them. There are exceptions, of course. But I mean, the traditional person who went on to get a PhD in a subject because they love research and they stayed in the university they're not the natural bridge to the working world right. that you would want to have okay. by themselves, no matter how good they are. Mm -hmm. So you have to, as a university, recognize that you have to push against that tendency mm -hmm. to be an island. Intentionality is the first. The second challenge is network. So you may want to, but where's your network? How do you reach out to, to, the, you know, to the world around you? So Fulbright is exceptionally uh, lucky in this way because its very brand is building connectivity internationally, but also across different sectors. Mm -hmm. That's what the Fulbright brand has always been about. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, we have hundreds, no, thousands of Fulbright graduates, first of all, from the School of Public Policy and Management, many of whom have gone to the private sector, by the way. So it's not all going into government but also Fulbright scholars from Vietnam, hundreds of them who have gone to the United States, returned since the program launched in the 1990s, early 1990s. So there are hundreds of graduates. They are very well connected. So the chairman They're of like our board of trustees, network, yeah. yes, yes. The chairman of our, own, our university board of trustees, Tommy Vallely, mm -hmm. used to run that Fulbright fellowship program, you know? And so they're all connected. Uh, and they're all aware of and very enthusiastic about contributing to the Fulbright University project. We're so fortunate in this regard. So we draw on these alumni uh, of Fulbright, broadly speaking, uh, to form a global advisory board that opens its doors through internships and other connections and serving as clients of applied exercises. That's been really great. Uh, not every university can benefit from that, but to the extent that they can, they should try to create this network of individuals and stakeholders on the outside. And the third challenge, uh, which really is the hardest for universities trying to bridge that gap, is to build specific capacities in the university to make the connections. It doesn't happen by itself, Quokine, right? Like, you can want this to happen. Everybody wants it. Right? Everybody wants it. And you can occasionally place a student in this internship or that student. But if you're talking about- And then the people from the industry come to school and yeah, kind of collaboration. They give guest lectures guest lecture. and so on. They do that all the time. Do it all the time. But there's a huge difference, a world of difference between doing it in an ad hoc, one-off kind of way uh, versus doing it systematically right linked to your curriculum and philosophy. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. And that's the capacity challenge, right? You have to build uh, mechanisms in the university that work on that full time. And the logic of those centers and, and staff is to reach out and, and keep those connections active and systematic and always on the cutting edge. So we have, for example, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, CEI. Uh, in our university. That's why it exists. It's doing innovation labs and other kinds of outreach to companies to place our students there. That's linked in turn to career services uh, to help prepare the students for what comes afterwards, right? And it's now linked to alumni network. Uh, so now that we have undergraduate alumni, they then become the cutting edge of more partnerships that we can form, right? Those, those alumni, the Fulbright 
graduates who are now working in consulting firms can become the clients uh, for applied exercises that our interns can uh, plug into, just like our Fulbright Public Policy School graduates have served in that capacity for our current undergraduates. Mm. That's making a lot of sense. You said that is the uh, the hardest part is yeah. the last one, capacity. which is yeah. building capacity inside a school and build a sy systematic uh, collaboration program with the employers. Why? It, what makes it so hard to do it? I think the resources you yeah. have, or I honestly the willingness think, from the employers, or how. First of all, I want to say many universities are going down this road. Yes. So it's not like we have discovered something I know, but not that, so effective. That's what well, I'm, I don't know. I mean, it more or less effective. It okay. just depends on the particular leadership mm -hmm. and the resources going into it and how systematically it's pursued. So it, it's not in in itself a new idea. But it's not a traditional part of the research university. So oh, it's okay. a new part of right. it, you know? How can I put it? It's kind of like in corporations, uh, focus on environment, society, and, uh, and governance, right? The so-called ESG, yeah. uh, corporate social responsibility, is a relatively new thing. Do, does it work easily in corporate cultures? No. It's new. And there's going to be some tension, and there's going to be some sense that it's just for show initially yeah. before it takes root and becomes institutionalized. Mm -hmm. My own field of study uh, as a scholar, I'm a public policy professor, yep. uh, is anti-corruption policymaking. So anti-corruption policies also, right? Many corporations have anti-bribery, anti-corruption, integrity, anti-conflict of interest type rules and so on. And of course, governments do as well. How do you make sure that's taken seriously as opposed to just being for show, just to look nice on paper? Um, same thing in universities. Um, I'm not equating corruption with anything in universities. I just mean developing something innovative that doesn't fit into the original DNA of that organizational type is always hard. It, it demands creativity and it demands constant tending you know, you have to take care of these relationships. Right. They're not one off. It's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So you have to find the right people who know how to do it. To give you an example, I'm recruiting now at Fulbright University a uh, vice president for innovation and business development. That sounds good. <laughs> to me, yeah. that vice president is responsible for the interface. Yes. Between the university you and the You need a vice president world. for that one. Exactly. <laughs> Serious Why? one. Because there are many staff working in this general area. How do you make sure their incentives and strategic direction are aligned? Right. And that they're well-led and that there's somebody at the end of the day whose job performance and success depends on getting that job done. Yeah. Right? There's somebody to do follow-up with the, those employers. AI is an interesting one because, frankly, I think AI is going to so revolutionize how society and the economy and the workforce work, not only in Vietnam, but obviously worldwide. Do you have any special message to employers or industry people who are listening to the program? Well, obviously, for this, you know, yeah. to make it easier for you for this collaboration, reach out to Fulbright University <laughs> Vietnam. We are here. We are ready to partner. Uh, and it's a win. I can tell you this for sure. Okay. It's a win win proposition. Our students do amazing work. And by partnering with us to place students in internships or to have teams of our students doing projects for you under the supervision of some of our faculty yeah. is amazing value. Uh, it mostly just costs your time, in a sense, your engagement. But you're getting top uh, intellectual value from these students and great motivation that they have to produce something that's truly meaningful and localized, You know, not just a project for a grade, but something that reflects the reason why these students went into their fields to begin with, that reflects that original motivation. This is work that you would have to pay <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars for <laughs> right. in one year's time, yeah. you know, when they go out on the job market. So yeah, please come to us and partner. We're, we're really interested in uh, creative uh, and innovative approaches in education and partnership. 
And uh, Forbright is new on the scene, and we're looking for partners. Uh, and you're certainly expanding to more specialization and majors yes, in the absolutely. future, right? That's all kind of majors, all kind of fields. Especially business. I mean, business. business is one of the next ones, just like artificial intelligence. And AI, of course. AI. <laughs> Everybody talk about it. Absolutely. This is a huge challenge for us going forward. AI is an interesting one because, frankly, I think AI is going to so revolutionize how society and the economy and the workforce work, mm -hmm. not only in Vietnam, but obviously worldwide, that it is our responsibility as a cutting edge uh, higher education institution. It's our responsibility to figure out how to help Vietnam find its feet, find its orientation in this changing landscape. It's not just a technical problem, Quoc Kain, right? AI is a political, a social, an economic, a business, a societal challenge, right? And so our liberal arts and sciences approach is perfect right. as the ethos to try to figure out how AI is going to create more value than it destroys going forward. And believe me, both are possible. Both scenarios, both that AI will disrupt and destroy value, undermine social, uh, social capital, undermine government regulatory capacity. So all kinds of negative effects that are possible. There are equally, if not more, exciting possibilities for value creation in society. What will make the difference is the capacity of governments to figure this out and to see AI in its broader context. We want to be part of that solution. For Vietnam. Since you mentioned AI, I have to ask you a question about ChatGPT because oh, yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> people talk about it and the yes. con, con, uh, controversies around GPT and how it impacts the creativity and the way students are writing the essays mm -hmm. and you know <laughs> and the thesis and yes, all of kind yes. of creativity. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what kind of policy that FUV have on this specific new thing that's Isn't coming that on is going to help yeah. students a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny you mentioned that. I actually yeah. have a personal just story a curious to question. share. question, yeah. No, 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 for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. great. So la I have a daughter who is uh, 17 years old, and she's a senior in high school here in Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah. Uh, going to Saigon South International School. Good school. And um, yeah, it's great. Uh, so last night I was looking over an essay that she wrote. And uh, she, sh she showed me on her computer. And by coincidence, I happened to scroll up and it, you know how you see multiple windows yes. that are open. I noticed that she was on uh, chat GPT yes. on another window. <laughs> so I opened it. Yes. And I saw that she was using, uh, it wasn't chat GPT, it was some other uh, Bing, uh, Bing uh, function. Like Google, yeah. Yeah, uh, Bing AI integrated okay. to help her rewrite certain mm -hmm. passages, yep. suggest rewrites. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I'm sharing the story because she wasn't plagiarizing. She was taking her own thoughts and finding better ways of expressing them yeah. through this technology. But she herself, she showed me because I was teasing her about mm -hmm. it. I said, you're cheating. What's going <laughs> on here? Uh, and she explained, no, I'm not. You know, I have to read through this and assess how it fits. Some things don't fit. Some things fit my intention. Mm -hmm. So I'm still the one driving. And the text is still mine in, the, in, in its original. Mm -hmm. I'm just getting help articulating what I'm trying to say. More choices, in a sense. Uh, that's one example from yesterday. Can I give you another example okay. from yesterday? How about FUV? Any FUV. Let yeah. me give you another example yeah. from yesterday. I was having an executive committee meeting, all of our directors and leaders. We are embarking on strategic planning for FUV. Uh, we're creating a new strategic plan. It's about mm -hmm. a six-month uh, exercise. <laughs> so very good. We've come up with an outline, and we went over that outline together. Uh, and then uh, we also, in the same meeting, had a presentation on AI. And in the middle of the presentation, I opened up chat GPT, and I wrote in the following prompt, suggest a good strategic plan outline for Fulbright University yes. Vietnam. I entered I'm into Fulbright. wondering what did it come out. And I, I hit the button. One second later, a full outline existed. <laughs> and it was rather close in many details. Amazing to the outline that we developed ourselves. Amazing. Down even to certain phrases. It freaked me out a little bit. Yep, I can imagine. <laughs> so I it shared it to me before. <laughs> I shared it with the whole group. And yeah. uh, 
you know, so these are just a couple of anecdotes and specifically about the teaching and learning side. Yeah. We are actually developing a policy and there's a disagreement among faculty. Some of I'm them sure. say we must ban the use of chat GPT on any assignment. The others are saying that's ridiculous. We have to teach students to learn how to use it and where the boundaries between plagiarism and just drawing on other sources are. Mm. Um, so I... What is I, the final decision? The, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always curious. I'm trying to decide whether I should announce it on your <laughs> podcast. Oh, really? It's not coming out yet? No, the, the, wow. the, the final decision yeah. is really more the latter. Yeah. You know, in other words, we're not going to abolish this technology. We Got have it. to help students think ethically about it and how to use it. I had another discussion, of, a third discussion about AI yesterday, uh, which was with a group of uh, board of trustees members. And we were talking about what can AI answer, what questions can AI answer, and what can it not answer. Mm. So a couple of us were very enthusiastic about AI, and the basic idea was there's nothing AI can't do. If not now, then just wait a little bit, and it will catch up. This can do it. It will do it. I had a different perspective. I said, what about value judgments? Uh, I gave the example, uh, should the death penalty be abolished? You know, capital punishment. Should a society have a law that says, if you do this or that crime, we will execute you? That's an ethical dilemma. You can research it using AI. And we actually did it on the spot, and we were exploring different ways of typing in prompts that would yield a debate. But you can't decide what is right or wrong because that value judgment rests with human beings. And the values that are at stake are in tension with each other or contradict each other. How do you order them in priority? That's a very moral decision that will come down to each individual. And then it will come down to public policy and the collective expression of a society's values. I think even theoretically, AI cannot answer that question. And that's only one example of you know, thousands of ethical dilemmas that AI may inform using knowledge but can never answer. Um, you know, there's a famous uh, poem by T.S. Eliot, the 20th century poet. And one part of the poem goes, where is the knowledge that we have lost in information? Mm, interesting. And then it goes on, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Very nice. And to me, this poem reflects the AI dilemma. Very nice question. There's information plentiful, unlimited information at your fingertips. There's also a whole lot of knowledge. In fact, I think the AI revolution is really taking information and making it more usable, hmm. more knowledge-like. Yeah. But then where's the wisdom? Can AI give us wisdom? AI that's a really cannot, good question. Yeah. I think that's the essence of education is cultivating wisdom. Uh, which will always be a fundamentally human endeavor that AI can inform but not replace. Looking ahead in the future, uh, with so much changing in this world right now, and you know AI and technology and the way we learn, from your perspective as a long-time educator, what do you think about the future of education? I mean, the future of college education um, as a learner. How are the how are we dealing with this this future? Yes very tentatively and with great humility. I honestly think most educators are just scratching the surface now of the possibilities and the changes that we will have to undergo in order to take full advantage of uh, the technologies of the 21st century. Um, so there are many examples. Uh, artificial intelligence creates the possibility for individual assisted learning mm -hmm. in ways that defy our expectations from even a few years ago. Yeah. We have just begun to think about how to incorporate that into the classroom. I would be incredibly surprised if we don't see a lot of disruption in higher education. We won't see a replacement or massive closures of many universities like some have predicted. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Okay. But I think we have to change our models of what education is and what the what the pro we won't see professors losing their jobs in by the millions across the world 
But we will see a changing role for professors in the classroom and a changing set of technologies that assist learning, uh, aided by the instructional design of those faculty. But the ways that that will play out, I can talk about the next few years, but it's very hard to talk about the next 30 years. Mm. So fast moving is the situation out there. How about liberal art education? How do you think it's going to be evolved in the future? And is that going to be the model that many schools and universities and colleges are going to be apply? The liberal arts model? Well, to be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter to me if they call it liberal arts or not. But it's what just I, a title, right? But what I, that's just a title. That's, uh, but what really matters is universities have to care about the educational outcomes of their students. And that cannot be measured just by factual knowledge alone. The premium, the, the benefit of having factual knowledge mm -hmm. in your area of expertise is being degraded by the availability of our information age. Does sure. that make sense? Yep. Because it's not hard to, to get useful knowledge uh, in so many fields, and that the barriers to accessing that knowledge are already almost zero. Yeah, you know, the marginal access, cost yeah. of producing and distributing information is falling. Yeah, everybody you know, can self-learn now. Exactly. So it's not just about specialized knowledge. It's about the teamwork skills, the ethical compass that people have, their sense of integrity, their, being, their sense of being uh, motivated, their flexibility as learners, meta-learning, learning how to learn. Mm. is increasingly important in an age where you have to continuously reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. So I deeply uh, hope uh, that universities take that seriously, that challenge of measuring the outcomes, aptitudes, and the ethical compass of their students uh, as rigorously as anything they've done before. Education, we, we often focus on the inputs. How good are the professors? Mm -hmm. How smart are the students who yeah. come in? You know, it's kind of uh, funny almost. Uh, the most famous universities in the, uni in the U.S., they're proud of how many students they reject. Uh -huh. We reject 99% <laughs> of applicants to our university. Uh, That's not a good measure of your quality. Yeah. That's great that you have so many students who want to be part of your brand name university. That doesn't tell you what the value add is wow. of the students from day one to the day of graduation. I hope that universities take that approach very, you know, very seriously because that's what society needs, a sense of how universities transform the lives of its students. After hearing you saying that, I guess uh, the title is not, doesn't matter anymore. Right, liberal art education or yet your Kai Phong or the Hap Kai Phong is just a title. No, that's right. What's that's the right. insight? And that's that's why we have to join together as universities and learn from each then other. All school could be liberal art. They right? can be. Yeah. They can be informed. If they by, can do what you just said, right. they mentioned the educational outcome. All students can incorporate yeah. human-centered learning. Yeah, if as you can do a that. Core philosophy. If you can actually do that, and we should learn from each other as we do. Yeah. You know, Fulbright University can learn from best practices around it. That's why we try to team up and listen to other partner universities in Vietnam and sure. beyond. And we have something to share as well. We're all in this field together. Right. Uh, cooperation and mutual learning yeah. is far more important than competition in yeah. the end of the day Make sure for the benefit uh, of Vietnamese society. Uh, we prepare for the best generation for the future of Vietnam. Indeed. Indeed, that's what it's all about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So for you, for your term here, uh, the your role as a new president of FUV, I mean, um, what is the uh, goal for you? I mean, the board of directors and the top leadership, well, what are the KPIs for you? Well, the KPI is a set of sustainable and innovative practices that transform our students' lives creatively engage with Vietnamese society, and that become a robust, value-centered community that is here for good. Okay. You know, and those three things I take very seriously. This is our strategic plan. Mm. Remember the outline yes. that I just mentioned? <laughs> Should we take um, it right at? <laughs> that, no, it didn't write. So just to be clear, it didn't write the strategic plan. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> you make me nervous yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> no, but first of all, transforming our students' lives through our degree programs. That's our core business, right? Sure. That's why we talk so much today about our graduates and how we lavish attention onto our students. And we and they become lifelong members of our community as well. Mm -hmm. That's the first core mission is to keep our curriculum cutting edge, continuously updated to seize the possibilities of of this moment that we're living in, mm -hmm. including artificial intelligence, but not limited to it. Um, and incorporating new areas like business education, which I just said. Mm -hmm. Secondly, though, creative outreach to Vietnamese society. Knowledge production, knowledge creation, sometimes theoretical, sometimes applied. Remember my phrase, yes. nothing is as useful as a good theory. <laughs> um, so that's critical, but also the creative ways that we extend our network and partnerships with corporations and nonprofits and the public sector. Um, how do we do that? Just like that capacity about, sorry, the question about internships and, yeah, and networks. Network. And then finally, how we build a community. We're a young university. What's important for us is to develop uh, deep roots in Vietnamese society mm -hmm. and growing impact and growing relevance in a value-centered community. We want our community to mean something. Sure. We're not here to make a profit. We are Vietnam's first nonprofit, independently government governed yeah. private university. Mm -hmm. We're proud of that. Sure. But we have to put meaning behind those words. We have to grow into something uh, that is uh, more impressive and relevant to Vietnamese society every day. That is that is the KPI. Can't wait to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. That, I'm in it for the long term. Wow, what a job for you now. It's a What's wonderful a, job, <laughs> and I'm deeply fortunate to to have it and to work with incredibly talented team yeah. of colleagues and students in the so process. So you have a uh, strategic plan already, and to execute the plan, the plan uh, effectively. What is, what is the biggest prob problem that you need to solve now? What keeps you up at night now? What keeps me up at night, um, frankly, is resource mobilization. We were not, again, my my slogan for today is to be honest, right? Yes. <laughs> so I'm just sharing with you the real Appreciate story. It. And the real story is uh, many universities, uh, many new universities or new colleges start with a huge donation that you draw down over 10 years or something right. like that, right? A hundred million dollars mm -hmm. or, you know. Uh, and I've been part of those universities. Uh, mm -hmm. At the National University we of Singapore, mm -hmm. National University of Singapore. In US, yeah. I spent 12 years there, my the beginning of my career. We started the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy with a huge donation, 100 million Singapore dollars, yeah, um, which is almost 100 mm -hmm. million dollars. And uh, that was not an endowment. That was to be used over a few years to build the largest school of public policy in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, other examples, New York University, Shanghai, etc. So to put it simply, Fulbright University of Vietnam was not started with a huge donation like that to draw down. Instead, we have core support from the U.S. government. We have generous support from the Vietnamese government in the form of land mm -hmm. uh, in the Saigon High Tech Park. Uh, and we are mobilizing resources. We're earning resources through additional mm -hmm. training that we do out in the world through sponsored research that we do for entities in the private sector and for government that we collect uh, funding for. And we, uh, of course, collect some tuition, although we waive more tuition than yep. we collect. We do collect tuition. Mm -hmm. So we have, some, we have sources of revenue, but we need to grow them substantially mm -hmm. in order to realize our full potential. So that's, my, that's what keeps me up at night because that's my job. My job is to work with others to unlock resources that help us become the great university that we are destined to become. Well, wish you the best in that Thank journey. You. <laughs> uh, I guess this episode's going to be on air around uh, New Year. Yes. Ted and oh, yeah, Ted is amazing, of and course. You want to say anything in Vietnamese for that? Well, I because would we love have a tradition to, of chuk tat, right? I would love to offer a <laughs> chuk tat uh, <laughs> message for your listeners okay. and viewers. And, right. that, and let me just read it. Um, <laughs> okay. Chuk tat ka kek bạn đang theo dõi Viet success. Một năm mới, thật nhiều tình yêu thương. Cho thật nhiều và nhận thật nhiều. Right? Cho thật nhiều yep. thật nhiều. Và nhận thật nhiều. So, uh, <laughs> rất hạnh phúc và khỏe mạnh. Mm. Uh, con thai và lộc 
thì cứ tới đều mỗi lớp một nhiều như dòng Baylen. Tuyệt vời, thank Baylen. you so much. Vì năm nay là năm con dòng mà. Yay! <laughs> so that's my message. I'm sorry I didn't thank you so much. deliver that's it wonderful. very fluently. <laughs> But I do truly wish all yeah. of your uh, viewers and listeners yeah. thank a you so much. Pet. And thank you, Quokai. Well, thank you. Really Happy fun. Lunar New Year to you. Thank you. <laughs> and to you and your family as well. Thank you. I hope to eat some fine uh, tut with you <laughs> <laughs> before Sure, long. sure. Let's catch up. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Scott Fritzen, uh, the president of Fulbright University in Vietnam. And I hope that you uh, find this one uh, helpful for your understanding about uh, liberal arts education in Vietnam. And uh, of course, it's, it's just the title. What matter is the inside, what we do for our students and uh, prepare them for the future, uh, providing uh, values for the graduates and matching them with the reality out there. And uh, Fulbright University of Vietnam are doing their best to uh, provide that value to our students. So thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. And you can always uh, follow us on the Spotify or Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts uh, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for the upcoming episode. And don't forget to uh, subscribe to our newsletter that uh, are going to bring you a lot of interesting updates every Thursday morning. Uh, click on the link below the video and uh, put in your email. Thank you so much uh, for listening and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you.